Uncensored. Welcome to CoasterNet Uncut. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of CoasterNet Uncut. I am, of course, Andrew Barczyk from Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Danny Miller, temporarily coming to you from Schnecksville, Pennsylvania, still home on break. And we have a special guest with us today, uh, the esteemed author of a, uh, a, a nice article that uh, was titled uh, by the website. What was the website name? Awesome Ocean. That was the website name. And uh, Awesome Ocean. And the title that they gave it was Activists Take the Fun Out of Everything. And we have the author of that piece with us today, uh, a so-called expert on our topic today, uh, Dr. Susan Werkheiser. Hello, everybody. Coming from <laughs> East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. How about that? And, yeah, and if you've guessed already, uh, today's topic is going to be about SeaWorld and that dreaded film everyone loves to talk about, Blackfish. <laughs> <laughs> dun 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 so uh basically what we're gonna do is that um in the last few weeks we've had a whole bunch of announcements coming out of sea world uh some major announcements that are affecting the park the management and uh we thought we would take this opportunity to look back at um the whole blackfish effect and blackfish debate and and see what the historical timeline is of what things happened when uh, to piece it all together, but also to look at it to see uh, if SeaWorld, um, you know, did the right thing and, and made the right moves. So that's why we brought uh, Susan here today to talk about, um, you know, from that perspective. And, and as you know, um, on CoasterNet, right at the beginning of this whole uh, debacle, I also wrote my own little a blog piece uh, that talked about the Blackfish film and uh, what I took from the movie. Uh, so let's start at, 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 at the historical timeline that um, if we look at 2013 is when everything started that um, at actually, you know, one thing we didn't talk about before is you could actually take it back a little bit further back to April of 2013 when SeaWorld decided to uh, release their first initial public offering which made SeaWorld a public company, um, that many think that by them doing that, it put a target on their head, that, that Blackfish was already in, in the works um, as a documentary film, but SeaWorld's huge initial public offering, which was overly successful. I, I remember writing the news story on it uh, back in April of 2013, and uh, Wall Street was all a buzz about SeaWorld, saying how great the initial public offering was, how it went above and beyond what other people expected. And I think it's from this environment of SeaWorld getting all this positive press that then in July of 2013, uh, Blackfish was released to uh, various film festivals and then eventually on a very limited release at theaters across America. And that's where I actually had my first experience watching it, is I went down to a theater down in Wrigleyville. I know, it had to be something special for me to take a trip to Wrigleyville, because I hate that place. I hate the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's interesting is I went into, the, went into, that, um, into that movie thinking that I was going to be a SeaWorld supporter, because, you know, I had just been to SeaWorld San Antonio in June, uh, I love that park. It was such a nice park. Everything was done so nice. I went to go see the whale shows and, and I went, I basically did everything. Um, and so then after watching that film, I was kind of surprised because walking out of it, I had a very different opinion about SeaWorld. And, um, you know, I, I had a few major concerns and, and, and my major concerns weren't so much um, about animal captivity in general. Uh, but rather about specific things that were brought up in the film, like things like uh, the trainer safety of trainers in the water, that, that we know that there's been a few deaths associated with uh, SeaWorld and people in the water, um, that you obviously the most famous was Don Brashow uh, at SeaWorld Orlando, uh, but you also had uh, a SeaWorld-owned whale in Spain attack um, you know, one of the trainers there and kill him. And then you had earlier things from before where uh, different whales were at different, um, you know, like Sealand of the Pacific, there was a death there as well. 
Um, so th that, w that was one issue for me is that the number of injuries and deaths uh, that occurred. Um, and then I, I just thought the film portrayed SeaWorld in a very, very bad light. And, and whether or not it was truthful or um, completely accurate, which it probably wasn't. I'm not going to sit here and say that Blackfish is completely oh. accurate um, right. because, because I know, Sue, you've looked at it. And, and there's a number of things. I guess not. First, my first experience with Blackfish wasn't in a theater or anything. In fact, I, I hadn't even watched the film for a while uh, until it was out it was for December when we were in Texas. That's exactly right. We, we watched it in the airport during our delay. After San Antonio, right. Um, I had read right. a couple of your blogs, uh, a couple of other things, and I thought um, – in fact, I went in thinking that I was going to hate SeaWorld because of reading all of that. And then I thought, well, I better watch this this film. So Dan and I uh, watched it after visiting SeaWorld. We had a good experience at um, SeaWorld San Antonio. Um, uh, I had read about the separation of mother and baby and that kind of thing. And they actually, um, at the one show we saw, had the mother and baby together and introduced the baby and um so it was only like was 10 watching, days old at the time right um and they were teaching us about the whales and and every every display that we went into had something that we were learning something new about so i thought okay how can they be saying that's not educational um because we were learning new facts about every animal that we saw um so we sat down and, and watched the film in the in the airport, and I immediately started started with my analytical brain writing down things, saying, "Okay, that's not true. That's not true. Well, this isn't true." And um, there, there's a bunch of things that that stood out. Um, now, after the fact, I found out that some of the trainers hadn't even worked with the whale in question, which is silicon. So I'm thinking, okay, this is supposed to be firsthand knowledge. Um, how are they talking about firsthand knowledge when they weren't even around? Some of them haven't even been at SeaWorld for 20 years. So I, I get that you can project experience from working with other whales, but many of them hadn't even worked with Tilikum. Um, some of them hadn't even worked in, in uh, Orca Stadium. They had been at the other, like the Whale and Dolphin Stadium, so they hadn't worked with Orcas. Um, I don't understand that. Um, some of the cuts in the in the, the film, um, for example, would show one would show the film. Uh, one of the trainers saying, "Well, you know, my first experience standing on a whale. It would be a different trainer." Um, you know, it, not co it completely inaccurate, but it wasn't her. Um, things like um, the. Kind of inaccurately portraying, and I'm, maybe we'll get into the life the lifespan or not, but inaccurately portraying the lifespan as, uh, you know, okay, a, a whale lives 100 years. Well, that might be the complete, all the way, extreme end. Like a person could live to 110 or whatever, but not saying the average. You know, so it's cut in a way that that may not be completely accurate or it, or it skews the truth in some way so that the average Joe who's watching it um, is completely, you know, taken off guard or whatever. Um, there was one scene that really kind of upset me where they had uh, it was one of the trainers who was bloodied in the face. And it led people to believe that he was bloodied in an accident with a, with a whale. And he, in fact, had whacked his head on the big, a jumbotron screen, mm. but the way that it was cut was, you know, you assume that it was a whale accident. Well, that's unfair to me. I mean, those are the major things that stood out for me in the film. I think there's more. There's a whole bunch of them, but those are the things that, you know, are really. And and for set. the and for the most part, um, the, the the film really did not spark a lot of interest. Um, it, it didn't. It didn't really start this whole groundswell of um, of support for Blackfish or against SeaWorld. It wasn't up until uh, CNN released it on CNN that, they, that for a number of weeks they would play it at night and, and and they would tweet about it that you know Blackfish is on and the Blackfish people would tweet about it and right. that really started the whole groundswell 
of of what eventually became known as the blackfish uh, effect and Right. And really, really in the fall, I, I don't think it really hit a fever pitch up until um, Thanksgiving when SeaWorld first That's decided to put to put um, to put yeah. their float in the parade at, at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day yeah, Parade. Yeah. Then we saw yeah. this huge, huge protest, and that's when everyone jumped in on it. That's when you start getting your PETA people jumping in on it. That's when the right. Twitter stuff started happening. That, 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 I think that's the first decision there that really was a bad decision. Um, that SeaWorld had never had a float in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade before. Um, it wasn't like this. It was like this. It, according, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I, I've not heard that SeaWorld – I thought that was like one of the first years that they ever decided to have a float. They decided to put they it in the parade. Had a parade float. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that too, yeah. because there's both of those found a little bit of protest. The Thanksgiving one was a little bit bigger, right. but the Rose Parade float definitely was pretty big too. Um, but but there is, I think, the first decision that why, as a company, are you putting a fo- a float in this parade um, amidst this big. Um, that that is now becoming, you know, a snowball effect where it's growing each day, and now you're going to shine light on your company even more by putting it into this public uh, arena. I to me, I I just think that's a bad idea without any other commentary, without any other um, because because the, the general policy was we're not talking about it. SeaWorld refused to talk yeah, about blackfish. That was a complete mistake, I think, on their part. I think as soon as that movie came out, initially I thought that the uh, my belief is that the purpose of the movie was to um, was to talk about Tilikum, not necessarily SeaWorld. And yeah. it was about Dawn's death and, and not really point the finger at SeaWorld, but it came out that SeaWorld was implicated, of course. Um, I, think, I think SeaWorld's biggest mistake was as soon as that movie came out, they should have took an offensive um, and, and put out their statement. They eventually took out that big page ad was mm-hmm. in, in response to that, but that should have been an immediate thing. And now as a person who ran school buildings, um, if something would have happened, um, a crisis or whatever, that's the first thing you do is crisis management. And I don't think they did enough in that respect. Well, and, and my first experience was the, with the film wasn't when it first came out in theaters. I didn't see it until later because I don't know in its initial run when it was in theaters, I don't think enough people saw it to really make a big enough deal out of it. I didn't see it until the fall when it was on CNN and it was on TV on a consistent basis, and it, my sister said that it was on Netflix. And I said, okay, I want to sit down and watch it because it was becoming a big deal because now you have the PETA people on board, and all of a sudden it's becoming a bigger deal amongst amusement industry folks. So I sat down, and Andy, you said you went into it thinking, you know, I'm a SeaWorld supporter, um, and you came out kind of surprised that – Okay, maybe maybe there maybe there's actually something to this. That, that I kind of get the impression that's how you came out of it. I went into the film thinking to myself, well, I've heard so many things about this movie that it's it's all about how bad SeaWorld is and all the bad things SeaWorld does, and it's completely anti SeaWorld. So I went in expecting an, a film that essentially just bashed SeaWorld and would reveal all these little things that they do poorly. And that's not what it was. To me, it didn't even – if you would have told me that – if you wouldn't have told me that it's anti-SeaWorld, I don't even know that I would have viewed it that way. I viewed it as a documentary about Tilikum, not about SeaWorld. And the fact that SeaWorld was involved with it was almost irrelevant to me. So I came out – I came out of it with the – yeah, I came out of it with the viewpoint that, okay, this is a whale that was captured – not by SeaWorld, but by a completely different organization at a time where it was acceptable to do so. It's not acceptable to do so anymore, but that was a common practice back in the 80s, I guess. Um, That's how a lot of these companies – yeah, that's how a lot of these companies and theme parks got animals. They don't do that anymore. They they have different means of acquiring animals. 
So I came out of it thinking, okay, here's this whale they got in the 80s, and it was treated very, very poorly at a different site, and now SeaWorld is taking the punishment for it. And that's how I always viewed the film. I always thought that SeaWorld got the – SeaWorld is an easy target because they're the most well-known. They're not as well-known as Marine Land. They're not as well-known as Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. (laughs) They are more – nobody knows what Sea Land of the Pacific is, and if you haven't watched Blackfish – Right, exactly. SeaWorld is an easy target because they're in Orlando, or at least the main park is in Orlando, the theme park capital of the world. You have Disney there, you have Universal there, and SeaWorld is lumped in with those parks because it's in Orlando. It's easy to pick on them. It's not easy to pick on Marine Land. Nobody goes to Marine Land. Six Flags Discovery Kingdom is kind of off the beaten path. Nobody goes after them. And nobody goes after your zoos and aquariums. So SeaWorld, I think, is unfairly – is SeaWorld perfect? No. Do they do things wrong? I'm sure they do. But at the end of the day, my viewpoint is I think Blackfish unfairly pointed the finger at, at SeaWorld for Tillicum's behavior when, in fact, I think they had little to do with it. And I think we're, we're doing – honestly doing their best with – such a massive creature to try and make it better. And I think maybe it was just beyond, it's beyond repair at this point with what was done to this whale in the past. And that's how I came out of the film doing it. Now, I, I agree with, I agree with uh, Susan that I think if, if SeaWorld really should have come out with a blanket statement and some, done some damage control right at the beginning, because when someone comes out and takes a shot at your company like that, you need to set the record straight right away. You can't wait six months or a year and then decide, okay, now we're going to do something about it. Because by that point, anyone who cares has seen it and has formed their own opinion. So I think they should have come out right away and said, no, okay, they do this, this, and this. We they, they should have come right out and said, this is false, this is false, this is false, and this is how we're changed. This is how we've adapted our habits and our behaviors to combat this, which used to be the norm in our industry, and it's not anymore. And they should have formed the opinions for the people who cared, and I think they waited too long to do so. Right. One of, one of the things that, that um, in particular is the whole idea of the operating conditioning versus the punishment thing. Sealand, or, you know, where, where Tillicum was, they did the whole punishment if you don't do the behavior. So now everybody has the idea that the, the whales don't get their food if they don't, you know, if they don't perform whatever it is, the behavior that the trainers want, but they use operating conditioning. Had Sealand come out and said right away, you know, the, the truth, you know, I, I think have already formed their opinion. There are documents out there that say, well, these are the falsities that are in Blackfish, but the SeaWorld didn't put them together. Um, people who um, realized that Blackfish wasn't necessarily completely true or had some half-truths in there put together um, this analysis, um, but SeaWorld didn't put that out. You know, other people did. So um, I think it was SeaWorld should have done that right away. And, and, and even when SeaWorld did start making responses, so like right after those parades, probably in the first half of 2014, SeaWorld started coming out with the full page ads, with uh, the statements against Blackfish. And even then, I didn't feel as if the stuff they were saying uh, w- was was the right course of action. And l- like you had said, most people who wanted to see this film had already seen the film and already formed their own conclusions about it. And basically SeaWorld's response was, no, those are all lies. And in fact, Blackfish, I, I, like we said, is, is not Phil, is not completely true, but there are some truths in it. Uh, for example, SeaWorld still in the first half of 2014 was going through the courts trying to get trainers back in the water. And and I, th- I right. think a lot of people said there's no reason for those trainers to be in the water, that it's a dangerous situation, right. um, that there's no reason for them to be there. But yet SeaWorld is still going through the court system trying to get them back in the water. It wasn't until um, – it wasn't – it was the, the yeah, step they, right before the Supreme Court. 
it did not go to the Supreme right. Court, but it got at the Court of right. Appeals. They, 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 right. they finally stopped and said, OK, we'll accept the ruling of not to put trainers back in the water. Um, the other thing, right. the other big issue that I know a lot of people have issue with is the size of the tanks. And um, and SeaWorld just did not respond accordingly. They, they basically, you know, tried to put out all the positives that they do with animals, uh, you know, things like I always joke around about the restaurant quality fish that they're fed, like a like a whale knows the difference between uh, fine tilapia and, you know, tilapia that's taken off a farm somewhere. Um, just stuff like that, that, that their response in general, I thought, was was inadequate uh, for the amount of trouble that they were seeing. And, um, you know, amongst the coaster community, there was a general thing of, you know, let's support SeaWorld, let's, you know, stand behind them. And, um, you know, it, I, I don't think the true magnitude of, of what the blackfish effect is really came to um, came to light until we started seeing the quarter results come in that that really even in 2014 the quarter results weren't really terrible it wasn't until the the third quarter of, of 2014 and then the fourth quarter of 2014 that we that, that we saw i just saw a graph the other day um the third quarter yeah. saw a 500,000 person loss from the previous year and then uh, at another point of the year, there was another 500,000 person loss. So basically in 2014, they lost 1 million visitors uh, to, to the entire chain. Now, we don't know for certain if it was all Orlando if it, or if the other parks had, had to play in that as well. Um, but a million person loss is a huge amount of people because if every single one of those people is paying 80 bucks to get in the park, which is that's that's eighty million dollars right there that you've lost. Plus you think of just and in I'm, ticket sales. Just in ticket sales. And I'm not talking about parking or concessions. Now granted every person's probably not paying eighty dollars, but I think when you average it all out for the for the amount of money that you're talking about a huge loss of revenue there. And SeaWorld just was not responding correctly. Um, but then to yeah. move it forward here, in May because uh, I remember sitting uh, at the end of my school year in a meeting, and I'm I'm reading through the news, and <laughs> yeah. So when 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 those administrators yap to us, I read the news about Custer's. <laughs> you, you, you're welcome. <laughs> so um, in the meeting, I saw that they announced this plan to increase the size of these enclosures to. Uh, basically re envision everything about the orca experience at SeaWorld. And I announced that earlier. And exactly. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, why in the world did it take them nearly a year to announce this? And, and the yeah. only thing I can That's come up with. Been in the works. Yeah. yeah. And, and the only thing I could come up with is that they had two plans on their desk, you know, in about September. And they said, well, we're going to see how the stock market plays, how, how the stock market plays out, how the attendance plays out, and then we'll decide. But now I, I think I think they were arrogant at some level and thought that things might not be as bad as they have been. And now when things are so bad that the stock market is tanked, attendance is down by over a million in a year, and now they're releasing this, and, and it's almost like – Okay, you're going to be able to bring some people back, but how many people are done for good now? That that they're and, and that's where that's where I think we have to open the discussion of, you know, what should SeaWorld have done? Obviously, I think we've already said maybe move this up sooner, but you know, what else could they have done to stop this? Um, I don't know. I think I think they they should have done maybe a better job at. Um, Pointing people toward the the rehab and the uh, rescue efforts that they do, I believe I know that people say that they put a minuscule amount of their dollars toward that, but you know there are a couple million dollars that they put towards that is more than a couple million dollars that other people put. I don't see PETA putting any money toward rescue and rehab. Mm -hmm. And when we went, um, we went. It was it was I was in tears actually um, when we went in November. We went to SeaWorld Orlando. This is my second visit there. We went down to the turtle track. And um, it was kind of profound because when we visited the tank before you go into the actual, uh, like, the, the ride, I guess you would call it, um, we have all these rescued turtles there. And the, she's not a trainer, I guess. She's the educational person. was telling us she could name every turtle by name. And... Um, 
And she told us each ailment, like one was from the Gulf oil region and was rescued and can't go back in because, you know, the, the oil had affected the turtle in a way that the, the turtle would never survive. I, should, I think one that had, turtle in particular was blind in one eye or something. And then yeah. um, the, one had, the um, other one you talked to, the, we talked about the shell had been hit, and yeah. I said, was that from a propeller, boat propeller? She said, that's exactly what it's from, yeah. and the cuts were so deep, better. they actually had to excavate out, like, the, a crevice in the back of her shell, and then close it back up, and one of the flippers was missing, um, and yeah. because they had to cut part of her, the, her, her name was Belle, was the name of that turtle, and because part of the shell was missing, she actually swam kind of lopsided, because they had to take a big chunk out of the one side of her shell. Yeah, she was concave. You know, her shell was concave. Yeah. There was another one that mm -hmm. had a missing lower jaw because um, that turtle got stuck in um, people's fishing, uh, fishing line. Net. And, yeah, and so it, like, severed the bottom jaw. So that turtle has to be hand-fed every day. Those are the kinds of things that I think um, if people knew SeaWorld did that kind of thing. Um, and if it ever closed, that would be, you know, non-existent. Um, they needed to focus on putting everybody's attention there um, in, in a more effective way. Um, maybe take their minds off the whole blackfish thing. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but that's that's where I think, um, hey, everybody, yes, we make mistakes, but hey, everybody, look what we do. Um, that's what I think we could have done a little better. And, it, and it's real e easy to go after the orcas because that's always kind of in the icon. It's in the SeaWorld logo. It's an yeah. orca fin. That's, that's, it's the dorsal fin of it. That, that's, that's, that's their icon. That's their logo. Shamu is the icon of SeaWorld. It always has been. But the orcas are, are – they're a large animal, but they're a small part of the overall experience. And I think – it's it's really nitpicky. It's it's like when we look at Banshee, it, is the track pink or purple? And we had a big discussion about that at Media Day. And at the end of the day, that's a small piece of the puzzle. And I, I think I think it's it works both ways. I think people in general, when they got off SeaWorld after Blackfish came out, they focused so much on this one piece of the puzzle that they forgot about everything else. And I think SeaWorld was so worried about defending themselves and just weathering the storm through that one piece, they failed to point out and say, well, look at all this other stuff we that we right, do. Yeah. And yeah. it's yeah. like, okay, we're not perfect. Any good company will admit that they're not perfect um, no. when the time yeah. is right. But at the same time, they need to point out what they, they – tenfold, they need to point out what they do right. Yeah, and, you highlight the positive, accentuate the positive. And, and definitely. And they didn't bring out the educational value. Yeah, I, I really believe there is that. Some people say no, but I do. I believe there is. Well, you know, I like, like I said, I, I've never been against animal captivity because I, I think that th there, there is educational experiences to be had at any zoo. Um, the problem with me and SeaWorld is that you've always it's it's been more so this circus focus of let's see the whales do tricks with trainers in the water and and I think finally the parks realize that and they're going to start moving away from that with these new enclosures and I just go back and I see and and I think about you know what if they would have taken you know the, the the positives that they do that they would have said okay we're taking trainers out of the water here's how we're protecting them you know even with them being outside the water you know they still have to interact a little bit and you know they're still animals and then announced these enclosures you do you do those three things in September and i really believe all of it goes away all of it goes away that 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 people's minds are going to say hey wait a minute Here's a company that has admitted wrongdoing, that has said, you know, in the past in our industry, you know, whales were mistreated. This is what we are doing to rectify that in our world today. We can't change history, but here we have a chance to right. change the future. And, and, and it's, right. it's their, their silence is what, what damned them in the end. It's, it's their silence for six to eight months on the issue that that led people right. to form their own opinions that led this movie 
uh, you know, whether it be truthful or not truthful, it, it still impacted a large number of people. Right. And there was no other side. There was no other side being presented. Right. Um, so at this point, Except people who are out there doing it their own, you know, doing their own thing. With it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's, it was the regular schmuck like us who were out there <laughs> trying to defend. Now we're getting slammed by the people. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and like I said, you're you're never going to win with radicals either. So uh, PETA is PETA is never going to support anything SeaWorld does. PETA is never going to support anything zoos do. So if you believe that animal captivity is okay and and it has value, whether it be for repopulation of a species, whether it be for um, you know, educational purposes for preservation, that, that zoos and aquariums have valid places in this world. Um, but PETA is not ever going to recognize that. So trying to win PETA yeah. over is a losing battle. It's never going to happen. Yeah. What you have to do is yeah, you, have, I mean, you have to win over the people like me and you and, and the kids at my high school who have right. seen Blackfish right. and now have this opinion that, those are the people SeaWorld needs to win over. Those are the people buying tickets. Pete is never going to buy a ticket. You need to find that middle yeah. group and have them come back. And that's who you lost in this. I really believe that those million people are those middle people who said, you know what? There's other stuff to do in Orlando. Um, even if, if they were only planning on spending a few hours at SeaWorld, hey, I'm going to go to the new Harry Potter thing instead. I'm going to go to the new Fantasyland instead. And I might have been considering SeaWorld for maybe not – no one's going to SeaWorld for a whole week, but maybe just for a day. And now they said, well, I don't want to support them anymore, so I'm just going to spend an extra day at Universal. So I, you know, people, when they go to Orlando, are doing everything. So the idea of one is robbing from the other, I don't really buy into very much because – most people, when they go to Orlando, are doing all of the stuff. They're in, and SeaWorld is that, that third thing that they might do. So you're going to do your Disney. You're going to do your Universal. Obviously, it goes Disney, Universal, and then maybe something else. And SeaWorld lost those people of that maybe something else where people said, eh, I'll pass this year. Um, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and ultimately, the CEO, um, you know, he had to step down. And, and he, he stepped down as CEO. Um, I, I think it was clear that, that at the end, like even in, even in financial documents and official statements, they would not name Blackfish. Um, you know, they still to this day will not name Blackfish in any of their documents because they don't, you know, they, they hint at it. You know what they're talking about. Um, but at this point, where does SeaWorld go? It by name. Yeah, exactly. And at this point, where does SeaWorld go now? Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that first, and because I have my own plan for SeaWorld. <laughs> Where do they go now? Um, well, if, if you're talking about releasing the whales, I, I don't think they can go there at all. I mean, just talk about, you know, plans to do that or whatever. I don't think um, that's a possibility. I mean, you have the, the PETA people or whoever, you know, screaming about sea pens and what have you, but – um, until they have some kind of formulated um, definitive plan about who's going to pay for that, um, you know, who's going to maintain that, um, and really what's going to happen to a whale that's in a sea pen. We all know about Keiko. Um, yeah. What happened to him? Um, you know, I don't. I, I'm not a scientist, so I can't you know, definitely say you know a whale's going to die in a sea pen, but. There's, um, I think, 35 whales or something like that. 26 of them were all born in captivity. I don't think any of them have a, a, a chance in heck that, that they survive. So no. I think the, cap, the captive whales that are there, they have to stay there. So we have to plan to take care of them as best they can. Um, I think personally, unless they are uh, – and this is just my own opinion um, – unless they are endangered, um, they have to stop the insemination for the purposes of, you know, filling up their tank. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. Um, you know, I, I, they did a lot of research on that, and I gl I'm glad they have the technology. It kept them from moving males and females around for breeding purposes, but I think they need to stop it for the purposes of filling their tank. Um, I think they need to um, – they have educational value. I think they need to bump that up and, and highlight that throughout the whole entire park. Um, 
because I think they do a good job. I think they can do an even better job at that um, and make it. Uh, I don't really think they do a circus-like job, but that's just my opinion. I don't think they do a circus-like. And I think as a, an elementary principal, um, the more exciting you get. I mean, you have Am I the science guy and, you know, um, Sesame Street, they all song and dance and things like that. That appeals to little kids. And even though they don't know work on the way out, they know, oh, well, Shamu. And they go look up Shamu, and then when they're developmentally ready, they find out that that Shamu is an orca. I think that does instill some kind of educational value. And, and um, I, think the, I think the shows have become a lot better since the trainers got out of the water. Yeah. So, so they focus less on I tricks. I believe they need to stay out, right. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. And like because before, Absolutely. like I I went to SeaWorld both before and after Trainers in the Water. Like I I was at SeaWorld Ohio a few times in my life, you know. So I I've been to quite a few SeaWorlds, and um and it just seems to me that that now the shows are so much more based on what 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 the education is is that yeah the the whales do a few tricks here or there. Uh, but a lot of times it's the trainers talking and, and putting focus on the whales. And I think the new enclosures are going to show that even more, that the new yeah, enclosures are going to show, um, you know, how, how uh, you know, a whale in, in, in open water almost. That I, I really, I really like the new enclosures that, that, that when I first saw that, I was in complete yeah. awe, just, just complete yeah. awe of what they look like. And and yeah. I, I'm so excited um, to to go see those. Yeah, they're going to start in San Diego, I think, next year with the construction. Um, we were in Orlando in November. One of the things that I noticed about their displays is every single every single display had some sort of educational thing. We saw this one in particular yes. that was all recycled items. They had gathered um, throughout the world and they put them together <laughs> in artistic things. Um, like we had a, a sculpture, it was huge, a sculpture of a fish, and it was made with all recycled things. Um, like to bump up that kind of thing, the recycling, the whole, yeah. you know, planet Earth kind of thing. Um, to to maybe filter some of their money. Like I, I know they filter money there, but filter more money into that. Um, they do a fabulous job with um, rescue and rehab efforts. Um, I, I mentioned the turtles, but there were also uh, pelicans and storks there. Um, that were rehabbed, you know, those were all fishing line things, like to build awareness toward the dangers that we as people do. This was all like based on fish, fishermen using um, some kind of filament um, that endangered these, these animals, like to make people, I had no idea, like fishermen were using this dangerous filament for their fishing line, mm -hmm. and damaging these animals. Okay, to make us more aware of that, that's going to be something that they could, you know, play a big role in, but they have to do it now. Um, and I think they and, need and to start I, pumping that up. I, 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 I hope uh, I, I have. The, I think I have those pictures of those sculptures she was talking about on Facebook. So maybe you can go find those, those and put these up while we're oh, talking yeah, about. Oh yeah, for them. sure. There were three or four of them. There was there was one that was an octopus. There was one that was a seahorse. There was one that was a starfish, and then they actually built like a mini coral reef. And all of the material that these things were made out of were like, pla uh, you know, aluminum cans, plastic bottles, the little six pack, of th the things that hold the six pack of sodas together. Um, it, they were all things that had been recovered from water or from beaches, uh, you know, in cleanup efforts. And that yeah. I, I think that's new because I don't ever remember seeing that there. And they had a whole area dedicated to how these were from relief efforts by, um, you know, SeaWorld people that went to help clean up beaches and clean, clean up water. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that they need to – accent that's the thing that they need to emphasize that it's not just about the orcas it's not just about the animals it's about th the environment in general and nature in general and you see that when it's extended to the bush gardens parks that's not yeah. about sea life in general that's about just nature in general when you see yeah. it extend into the bush parks and, well, and, they, act, they actually have SeaWorld Bush Gardens Foundation that, that is the charitable um, foundation that they run, um, and that partners with a lot of, like, the, the National Science Teachers Foundation and all that kind of stuff. I mean, 
there's a lot of partnerships that the regular person doesn't know that goes on. Um, they have to accent that. And the, the, the one piece I think that they need to do, um, and we haven't talked about it, is I think they need to – because the, the other part is, is is just slumping business overall in competitive markets. And, and I think they need to start acting like more of a traditional theme park as well, where, you know, I, yeah. I, I know it was a complete flop. I know Empire of the Penguin is generally regarded as a complete flop. But I think it's that type of thing that they need to start doing more of, uh, integrating new yeah. ride technology and new types of rides within these enclosures, within these this this world of the animal, maybe add a few more thrill rides. Um, like I, yeah. I really think that like if they want, kingdom kind of thing. absolutely that they need to start accessing yeah. that because Disney is getting more competitive, Universal is getting more competitive every year. It, for them to survive, I don't think just acting like a zoo is gonna is gonna have them survive. I think they need to start adding more rides, more coasters, um, and that's gonna bring different yeah. elements of people back to the park. I, I I know you guys go every year, but I I can tell you I I went to Sea World you know three four years ago, and and to be honest, I have no desire to go back to Sea World Orlando, uh, just because you know I yeah. I, I was. I wasn't a huge fan of the rides that they had um, and the animals aren't enough of a draw for me to go. Um, you, you know, so, so if they were to yeah, start, you look at the marketplace. Yeah. You look at the marketplace where they're sitting San Diego and you have all those theme parks over, and they have high thrill rides. Oh you yeah. Look at Florida where they are. And you look at Texas and they're amongst, you know, Fiesta, Texas, mm -hmm. and you've got six flags over Texas. Those are theme rides. Those are high thrill rides. You know, they. Are, I think you're exactly right. It's a market. And and I think I, all, I think SeaWorld has always kind of prided itself on being different. Um, and you know, they're not Disney. They're not Universal. They're kind of a combination of those two and a, a zoo. And that's how Six Flags Discovery Kingdom has always stood out amongst the chain. You know, they're not your typical. Uh, they're not a typical Six Flags park, which by definition makes them atypical. And in our society, being atypical and being different is is something that makes you stand out. SeaWorld at this point, I think we've become so accustomed to what SeaWorld is that them being atypical to the Orlando market is no longer the draw that it once was. Mm -hmm. And I said this months ago when we did our Disney show with Kane, I, I talked about how you have Harry Potter at Universal and Transformers, and then you go over to Disney, you have New Fantasyland, you have Avatar Land coming. All signs are pointing to we're seeing a Star Wars Land coming. It's all push and pull. On, they're all pushing each other. Even Fun Spot, now with White Lightning and Freedom Flyer, all of a sudden the Fun Spot is doing very, very, very well down there in a very crowded market. Legoland's numbers are through the roof, and that's only half an hour away down in Winter Haven. You have a very crowded market, no pun intended, you have a very crowded market down there in Orlando for theme parks, and for the most part, most of them do very well. Bush Gardens Tampa, an hour away. Bush Gardens Tampa does very well. And that's, you know, obviously that's because they're in a year-round climate and they're one of the, the big box parks. But when you look at – They also have animals. Yeah. I think the SeaWorld parks, uh, Orlando, um, San Antonio, and San Diego – Maybe they need to kind of move towards being more of a Bush Gardens yeah. model. Now they're the same company, but maybe they need to go more in that direction where it is more of your typical theme park in, instead of a marine zoo theme park combination. And maybe they need to be more like a Bush Gardens, which is kind of like what Six Flags Discovery Kingdom is. SeaWorld is always focused on it's about the nature and the wildlife first, and then the rides are secondary when the Bush Gardens and Discovery Kingdom have all been the other way around. Maybe they need to switch that. Maybe that'll work for them. What's interesting about Discovery Kingdom is the orchids that were there are now in SeaWorld. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. the other interesting thing to note. So who knows? 
Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there is that I, I when you look at like, you know, Bush Gardens in particular, it's all about what new ride is coming. And when the announcements come out, they don't they, they, they don't really emphasize like they do. Like I get press releases all the time, like Tampa Bay just added a new elephant to the herd down there. So I get press releases. But how many how many websites have you seen that press release on? I didn't post it. Most people aren't posting those press releases. Um, but yet when Falcon's Fury is announced or when this new thing at Busch Gardens Williamsburg is going to be announced, you're going to see a, a slew of, of websites posting that whenever it's announced. Maybe the first day it opens will be when it's announced. All they got to do is put in three more pieces of track and it's done. So. Yeah, so they'll just open it <laughs> randomly, I guess. Um, but yeah, so if, if SeaWorld – and you look at SeaWorld in particular, they have Manta. They have Kraken, which are two pretty big B&M coasters. And and really Orlando is kind of Orlando's kind of devoid of that like really coaster park. Like, yeah, Islands Adventure has a few, uh Disney has a few coasters, they're all kind of family coasters. But what if SeaWorld actually said, well, hey, we're gonna start building some pretty intense stuff? And from all reports, oh, yeah. the, the Manta out in San Diego is supposed to be a pretty, pretty good ride. Like uh, you, you know, a pretty, pretty good Mac coaster. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's the route SeaWorld Orlando needs to go because I, I think it, it, it's hard to tell from the numbers, but I think uh, the big loser in the chain was not, were, were two. It was SeaWorld Orlando and SeaWorld San Diego were the two biggest losers in the chain. I think Bush Gardens pretty much held their own for attendance, and then SeaWorld San Antonio holds their own for attendance. Um, because for some reason, SeaWorld San Antonio has kind of like gotten like escaped the whole blackfish effect. Um, that anytime you look at their Twitter yeah, or their weird. their Twitter, their Facebook, it's all clean. That. Yeah. It's... Yeah, they have Texas squirrel keepers down there for uh, protecting them. <laughs> That's I think a good people group. just forget that that part's down there. Yeah, it's it's just like they they just get away with it, and and I like I love SeaWorld San Antonio. That that entrance for. Oh, that's the best that entrance, entrance in theme parks. Right? Oh my god, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. So I but I really think yeah, that maybe Christmas time is even better. Oh yeah. Um, so, so maybe that's the route they need to go in Orlando and maybe even San Diego is start with the pens, start with the new bigger, you know, enclosures or whatever you want to call them, um, and then start moving into more of a traditional theme park style thing because I, I think that's where the yeah. money is. Like the, the money's, you know, people – almost treat the animals as like your logos and as like a side attraction, but people are going to want to come for what's new and I, they're not going to come for a new Shamu show. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't think that's a huge draw, right. you know, Oh, we're, we're starting well, a new Shamu show. Me and I, and I'm, uh, that wouldn't even draw me and I'm a SeaWorld supporter. Yeah. So and, any final thoughts uh, from the panel tonight? Anything else you want to cover? I think. Go to SeaWorld. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to go to SeaWorld. But I, <laughs> read your article. I, I'm going to go to SeaWorld, but I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go when San Diego opens up their new pen. That, that that's what I've decided. That that will be my big return to SeaWorld. I haven't been there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I haven't had, been to that that SeaWorld at all. Yeah, I haven't either, and I figure that that's a great time to go to experience that and to experience Manta. So, you know, hopefully, you know, maybe even I'll go see if I can wiggle my way into like a media day out there or something, you know, get, get myself in and there you go. get some, All right. maybe I don't, don't get too close to the whales though. Don't get too close. Well, the other, the other thing too is we need to remember that, um, there are other parks out there that mistreat their orca oh. and SeaWorld. I mean, like, come on, Marineland. I know that's Danny's favorite park. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry that the stuff yeah, I've seen out of Marineland. Everyone loves Marineland. I, I, I'm sorry. The yeah, stuff. I mean, and, and, oh, it's just terrible what I see out of you know, Marineland. It just you feel, I know. You feel you feel bad for me. They're focusing on SeaWorld, and I'm thinking to myself, Lolita's by herself. Kitsch is by mm -hmm. herself. There's, there's other whales out there that have more desperate needs than, you know, the, the whales that are at. Um, and, 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 and you two know me very well. 
you two know me very well and that I am very hesitant to badmouth a park and to badmouth a ride. I always try and find something good to say about a ride or something uh, good to say about a park with the exception of, like, your mind erasers and your crap like that. Um, but even when I rode Manhattan Express, I said it wasn't the worst roller coaster I've ever been on, which is probably about the best thing you could ever say about Manhattan <laughs> Express. But um, I would think Marineland is probably – off the top of my head, Marineland is probably the one park that I wish I wouldn't have paid to go into. I would mm. have been okay. And, and I paid to go ride the roller coaster. I paid to ride the 450-foot tall S&S Tower. And, you know, I paid to, you know, credit whoring, as they call it. I paid to get my two coaster credits to go to the park. I checked it off my list. I rode Dragon Mountain ten times. I rode the Drop Tower but having done that, I think that might be the only park that I've been to that I wish I wouldn't have gone to, and I'd be okay with not having those two. I, I've done it. I'm glad I did, but at the same time, it, I probably would be okay if I wouldn't have done it too. It's just it, – Marine Land is, is just not something that I ever really plan to go back to unless it's with, you know, uh, friends or family who want to go there. Yeah, and, I, I got to go get my credit there. I'll, I'll be honest. Just, I, there's traditions uh, out there that are way worse than, yeah. I, I, I was looking. Yeah, like, and, the, yeah, and the other yeah. thing. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that I was looking at doing a trip up there this summer. Like, you know, that the, the, the Canada's Wonderland doing that, maybe some Martin's Fantasy Island. But Marine Land, I'll be skipping. I, I don't. I, even though I've been told yeah, by a skip, number of I people that that arrow is the best arrow looper out there. It's like I don't I don't care that much to, oh, to really? support a park. Yeah. Right. I would say, I would say among the aero looping coasters, I would go Tennessee Tornado is the best, mm -hmm. and then I would probably put Dragon Mountain. I would put Dragon Mountain maybe right in like the same category as Loch Ness Monster, but it's bigger and faster. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's it's, it's in that high. discussion. You know, it's 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 not like it's 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 not like an amazing steel roller coaster. It's not on your level. Like B and M's, I think Tennessee Tornado is on the level of some of your B and M loopers. Um, but um, at at the end of the day, m I guess my final thought is, I'm still a Sea World supporter, and I probably always will be if I still am after all this. My biggest fear, and I think you two know this, is my biggest fear is that the whole SeaWorld backlash is going to affect the Busch Gardens parks. And the two Busch Gardens parks, uh, Williamsburg in particular, are – Williamsburg is probably my favorite park, and Tampa is not far behind. Um, you know, even though they have they – have, they both have six or seven roller coasters, and they're all fantastic. Um, you know, the scenery is nice. Uh, they do have the animal – type things there, but they have great rides, they have great food, great scenery, it's it's everything that I want in a theme park experience, and I really hope, and, and I'm worried that we're seeing it already with Busch Gardens Williamsburg putting in a clone ride, and that's something that they just, they, they haven't done. Now, yeah, when they put one ride into the one park, then they put in something similar at the other one, but it's still different, like Alpengeist and Montu, Griffin and Shikra. Um, Kumba and, you know, you have Loch Ness, but you had Drock and Fire at Williamsburg, which isn't there anymore. But you see similar type things, and I really hope that they don't start going into the clone foray because it's, it's like an out to say, yeah, we have a new roller coaster. Great. But it's something that I've ridden in California already. So I'm going to go ride it. I'm going to enjoy it. But when I, I want stuff like Verbolton, I want stuff that is unique, that they have their own special storyline that you can I only do at that yeah. park. It's, it, it's easy to build the tallest, fastest, longest of anything because it's easy to build a record and it's easy to get people to come and ride that once. But if it's like a King to Ka where it's the tallest, fastest, it's only going to be the tallest and fastest for so long. And it's only going to thrill people for so long. The stuff that will – Keep, keep people coming back is the experiential stuff that will always be special regardless of if it breaks records and I hope we don't see the bush parts and SeaWorld and I, I hope we don't see them go away from that because they've been 
very good at doing that for so many years, and I and I hope that they focus on that. Uh, Susan, any final thoughts from you? Um, I think I said I just don't want anybody anybody to forget there's other parks out there that you know people seem to be focused on SeaWorld. Go to SeaWorld. Mm. I'll support SeaWorld. SeaWorld, I always will. But there's places that are deserve more attention than SeaWorld does. Yeah, um, and and the, the only final thought that I have is that I have lifted my ban on the Sea World parks that I just went to Bush Garden. Like it is mostly because okay. of the announcement of the uh, of the enclosures that I think that's showing a step in the right move. That that was my biggest complaint was the size of the pens, um, and then of course the trainers in the water. And basically, Sea World's taking care of both of that. And I can deal with with the other little things. So, you know, I I went back to Busch Gardens uh, for the Hollis Scream event, and I'll I'll go back to SeaWorld when they open up the pens um, uh, to see the new enclosures and and experience those. So I think we've had a pretty good discussion here today. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Susan Werkheiser for coming on, uh, the the noted author of various uh, black anti-black fish uh, (laughs) materials on the (laughs) the Internet. (laughs) You you look up your name, and it's it's all over the place. Oh, man, you can find... Educational stuff. Um, I'm of course pro educational. Pro education, yes. Um, I'm of course Andy Rabarczyk from Chicago, Illinois. And Danny Miller, currently from Schnecksville, Pennsylvania. And as always, ride on, ride warriors.